Hi, this is Steve Hodgden from Modern Asset Management, and I'm here today with Dion DiPioli of Secure Debt Exchange in, uh, in Indiana. And Dion and I have been working on purchasing uh, distressed mortgages and using his analytics and experience to make sure that we're buying the right assets at the right, uh, at the right price. And my experience to date is I've been very happy with the returns that I've gotten on a pool of 28 mortgages and 11 states. So at this point, we'll say hello to Dion. Hello, I'm Dion. So, <laughs> so uh, from, Dion? yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I'm actually, I, I originally from Indiana, lived in Florida for a while, ran an investment fund there and uh, recently moved back to Florida. I, I am the owner and operator of uh, Secure, Desk, Secure Debt Exchange Systems, SDXS for short. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna take a look at a, uh, a loan pool today, talk a little bit about some of the analytics that we do and how we derive pricing and then what that looks like when we push it out to uh, potential investors and what they should be looking at and uh, paying attention to if an asset is of interest to them. Okay. All right. And for those of you that don't know where to find Dion on the web, it is sdxs.us, not .com, sdxs.us. And so, um, Dion, do you want to share the uh, pool that we've been working on? Yeah. So... So while he does that, um, this portion of analyzing an asset is the quantitative part. It's the numbers. It's figuring out the valuation. Um, we trust some data that comes from the uh, seller. Um, this is not the qualitative boots on the ground. Go take a look if that's what your that your thing is. It's not specific to an individual state um, or your particular niche that makes you um, a better better investor than the mainstream so uh he's got the tab up now so here we go so this is the pool um the the raw data exists on our data page and this is the data as it was presented to us from the seller uh we aggregate it into our own template um for just a consistent um uh, uh look uh this helps us also load it into our system efficiently which we'll get to in a couple minutes. Um, but just some, some highlights here in, in the loan data. So the, uh, the pool is mostly um, non-performing loans. So uh, we have about 20 non-performing loans and we have two loans that are in forbearance um, that have some cash flow coming out of them. So we get a little mixed bag of goods here. And you know, sellers will provide us with um, there's no real normalization to the, uh, the data that sellers provide when the reason that we continually share our template is that the color codes up here um, actually mean um, yellow is, is a mandatory field for us. So if we don't have those yellow fields, we, we actually can't run the pool at all. Black is nice to have, um, and, uh, but it's, it's not mandatory for us to be able to price some stuff out. So for those of you that have seen some of our stuff, um, that, that's actually what the color codes mean. And this particular pool, this particular seller has provided us with um, their asking price. So we have some commentary over here in column G, which is, um, it's, a little, uh, it's a little ambiguous. It's, it's, um, it gives us an idea of what, uh, you know, what generally is going on in the file, but um, it's, it's not necessarily quantifiable into a segment of time um, because, you know, pending the, pending the scheduling of the foreclosure sale, we really need to understand, well, um, how far away is, you know, uh, are the sales out in that particular county? Um, and, and when is it going to get uh, scheduled? Um, and so we'll kind of see how that, uh, affected some of the, the bid numbers once we start looking at some of the, um, some of the, some of the rest of the bid. Um, but so over here in columns P and Q, we have uh, the sellers given us um, their asking price. Um, in this particular pool, this particular seller has based most of those asking prices off of their BPO value. Um, and a side note about BPO value, the way that we approach the data when it's provided to us from a seller 
is we we take an assumption that there is some truthfulness to to the data and that it has some integrity, um, and, and we don't necessarily start off by um, drilling through BPO data. I know a lot of newer investors will do that, um, but we're going to assume you know based on some of these uh, more recent uh, BPO um, numbers that there is some accuracy here to uh, the BPO numbers that they've provided. Now, when we send a pool out, if you are interested in an asset, um, it is of value for you as, as the investor to do a little bit more research, scrub that address a little bit, um, see if you agree with that BPO value. We're not out to have an argument or a conversation about the BPO value because that, that, that tends to be counterproductive. Um, the moral of the story here is, um, sellers asking for a number. Do we agree with that number based on the the, the inputs that we have or not? Um, what we don't want to do is try to fall into a conversation where, um, you know, we we think the house is worth a hundred thousand, the seller thinks it's worth one hundred and thirty thousand. At the end of the yeah. day, it's Dion, how much are we going to pay for it? Yeah. Dion, um, yeah. Um, I want to move. I want to move little, ahead a little bit. Um, okay. We resolved in the large pool that I bought. We resolved that issue by contracting that we would agree that if our BPO matched their BPO, we were fine within 97%. So if we came back with a BPO that was 90% of, the, of what they had said, then we'd have a discussion about that particular asset. And so you can tell the, you can tell, you can give an indicative bid and say, I agree with your BPO and if my BPO matches, then we have a deal. So that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's a common that's a common term that we do to protect ourselves. So we, 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 we leave it open for us to be able to fade our bid if the BPOs come back right. And and fade your fade your bid is an industry term that uh, that new folks aren't going aren't gonna understand. <laughs> um, so my, my job here today is to translate you into English from time to time. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's take a um, let's take a look at your pool cover sheet. Yeah. Because this this will let me uh, ask some questions about particular uh, particular items. You had said in the uh, earlier that this seller priced his pool based on BPO, uh, based on a percentage of broker price opinion, which brings you into having to think about what's going on with that individual market. Is it is it rising, falling? Can um, is this will this hold up over the course of doing the foreclosure? Um, the other ways to look at this are. Uh, from percentage of unpaid principal balance, uh, which is your basically your discount is really what your is based on, and uh, one that was very important to me was loan to value. Uh, I was looking to be as safe as I could, having weathered uh, the last uh, recession when market prices really collapsed. That I wanted to uh, make sure that um, I was well covered in this in this pool. Um, but, but that pool was performing loans primarily, and this pool was non-performing. So you throw loan to you throw loan to value out the window to some degree, um, but it does help you when you look at the individual loan to see what happened and why it's not being paid. Um, so um, let's just go through here quick. You've taken a pool of 22 accounts um, for a total of 3.3 million dollars. Um, that is a BPO of uh, just under three. And you've come up in the middle column with a bid with a bid price judged to two as fifty-seven uh, percent of, uh, of unpaid balance and sixty-four percent of broker price opinion, and that seems a pretty good buffer to be able to uh, collect the, collect any of these out through foreclosure and make a profit. So I'm going to walk through uh, some of the higher some of the other points in the sheet now. Yeah. So um, it, just sticking with the top top row there, which is kind of, you know, high level data, the, the pool itself. So the, the, the accumulate all the assets, the, the 22 assets have a, have an exit month of 242 months. And the reason that's, the reason that's out so far is because we have those couple of loans that are, um, in forbearance. So those two loans, you know, one of those two loans goes out another 242 months. Um, that isn't necessarily 242 months to run through a bunch of foreclosures. Obviously, that, that would be a little excessive. Um, then what we what what our system does is it goes through um, each individual loan. We price out each individual loan, and we take it through its entire life cycle. And as it as our system does that, it delivers the costs on a per period basis. Um, 
depending on the, the disposition strategy that, that we take into account. Generally speaking, um, we, are, we, we stay conservative. So in other words, when we look at a non-performing loan, um, the most conservative approach in, is I'm going to have to foreclose and, and likely have to evict somebody. So that's going to be the most expensive and timely uh, disposition strategy that we have. And so when we produce our numbers, um, we, we use that. And then as an as a investor and, and managing your asset, um, your job, if you will, is to manage the time better and manage the expenses down. And if you do that, then you will, you will actually outperform the, the, the bid that we deliver. So um, let me just yeah, let me comment on that was we all of us to go to conventions and talk to the big gurus and have taken classes and read all the books. Um, the, they always talk about the five different ways that you dispose of an asset, and how you make money. And we're only talking about the asset here. We're not talking about, uh, about, about uh, rehabilitating the borrower. We're not talking about a loan modification. We're not talking about the magic that they're suddenly going to give you a bunch of uh, arrears. Um, but in point of fact, that sometimes happens. Uh, we, had a, we have a $900 a month mortgage uh, in Michigan that went into default. On the notice of uh, the response to the notice of default was a check for nine thousand uh, dollars, and that was about the level of collection work that uh, that had to get done. We started foreclosure, and the borrower immediately brought the loan payment uh, current. So there will be there will be some of those, but we take you taking the view here that everything takes longer than you expect, and so let's might as well budget it out to the very very end. So one of the things that intimidated me when we first started uh, working through this was the holding cost expense. And it's like, oh my goodness, I've got to keep all this cash on hand to manage this note through this whole process. And, and, that's, and that is, again, the worst case uh, scenario based on, based on the typical time frame right along all the way to foreclosure. Right, so to, to just kind of go over this, this sheet uh, a little bit, this is, the, 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 the tab that we're on again is pool. So this is a pool summary. Um, this is an aggregate of all of the loans. So um, all of the numbers that we see here are, are an aggregation of the 20 non-performing loans and the two per, um, performing loans. So what we, what, what we do is we, 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 break the, we break the assets into three segments. We have um, purchase cost expenses, which is the costs that are incurred when you purchase a loan, right? So that's that's everything with a PCE. That's what PCE stands for, for purchase cost expense. So in there is due diligence, um, due diligence fees, trading fees, um, uh, you know, credit. Um, generally, these these stay pretty consistent. So you know, we 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 have a due diligence product. We have a, a transaction management fee that 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 we um, put out um, with pools. And those numbers are taken into consideration as the bid is determined. So you have a, you have a true cost basis as you're stepping into the loan. Um, and what happens is that that produces a bid price for us. And the bid price plus the purchase cost expense is how we get to our internal purchase price. Um, and now some of these terms are, uh, a lot of these terms are, are unique to us. They're not really industry terms. So internal purchase price is, is sort of a purchase cost basis. Um, we just call it an internal purchase price. And then as um, Steve was talking about, we have, uh, so, so now you purchase the loan. Um, you've got it boarded with your servicer um, and you're going to hold the loan and you're gonna start to, to work through it. Um, and that simply is our holding cost expenses. Um, and those are signified by anything with an HCE in front of it. So we got purchase, we got holding. Um, so this is the, this is the column that, that Steve was just kind of talking about, that these, these holding costs can be a little expensive. And these are very often some of the fees that are, um, are, are likely um, not, not considered correctly. So, so in other words, um, you know, a lot of times we talk with some, some newer investors and they're like, I'm going to go buy a non-performing loan and the only expense I'm going to have is a foreclosure legal fee of you know, X. And that 
ignores all of the other things that you really should be paying for to protect your interest in the asset. And so things of that nature include advancing for taxes, advancing. Um, and so just as a, as a side note, I'll kind of break some of this down. So we, we use an estimate on the taxes until such time that we get the actual tax bill, um, and which we don't get until due diligence. Um, the LPI here is lender placed insurance. So that is any insurance that goes on to the asset while it's still a loan. And then VHI stands for vacant hazard insurance. So that is insurance that goes on to the loan um, when it's already out. They're two distinctly different um, insurance policies. And we use a pretty standard um, ins insurance um, cost model. Um, we don't insure the assets for their full BPO value. We insure assets for our cost basis. So um, depending on how you do it, you, you know, de depending on where you end, um, uh, when, when you set up your insurance policies, some of these, you know, some of it will vary, but you know, at, at the end of the day, lender placed insurance, uh, only needs to pay you back. Um, it doesn't need to replace the house for the borrower. And, um, in that, if you're properly servicing your loans, your, your LPI letter should say that. So then we have, um, foreclosure fees, which is going to be the, the legal fees for foreclosure. And, um, this is going to vary by state. Um, there's, we have historical data from the loans that we've owned and worked on. We have some historical data from the GSEs, um, that go into creating these estimates and you'll have scenarios where, um, you know, there's, there's a couple extra dollars that need to go into an asset that what might've, that, uh, that might be more than what was budgeted. And you have scenarios where, um, it'll be less, um, you know, as an example of, of why it might be less, perhaps the house is vacant and the, the process was, was in that particular state, the process is allowed to go a little faster. Um, and then we do in, in most foreclosures, uh, especially, you know, nowadays there, there's an order of, a, there's an order of eviction, um, that comes with, um, the judgment, uh, or the approval, uh, the approval of the sale. Um, but we still, we still cost out. Um, an eviction time and an eviction cost um, just in case that additional legal action is there. Again, we, we'd rather be conservative and have that cost in there and not use that money than we would uh, be in a position where uh, we need that, we need to spend that money and we didn't budget for it. Um, the, the next thing that we have in here is the, the um, uh, REO repair and maintenance. And this tends to be a little deceiving to, to some folks. Um, in general, our, our repair and maintenance budget for, for an asset is about 3,500 bucks. And that's gonna include, you know, you, you're, only, you're only gonna do any R&M once, uh, um, uh, once the asset turns into an REO. And that might include, um, you know, some uh, trashing out the property, um, maybe, maybe a little cosmetic, um, appeal, some, um, some property preservation, uh, perhaps some, uh, some, some lawn mowing in summertime or uh, wintertime might be, you know, getting out and salt and stairs and stuff like that. Right. So, and just a, just a second on that. And it's, it's, that brings you back to the quality asset you're buying, how quickly you're going to be able to exit it. If you're playing in the lower end of the market, you may often wind up with a, a note in Cleveland that you're going to have to winterize the house, you're going to have to make sure the lawns mow, or the city and the county are going to start finding you and putting liens on the property. Um, you can, some places, if you don't take care of the place, it can get bulldozed. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's important that you recognize that uh, that's part of the downside of this, and you should be prepared to exit your properties as quickly as possible. Yeah, and, and, and with that, just to kind of give everybody an idea of time, right? So the, the average days on market for real property in most markets is 120 days or less. So if we're priced right in, in the market, the, the, uh, any asset should sell within 120 days. So if you're holding on to an asset that's for sale and it's out there and, and you're, stuck, you're, you're well past that 120 day mark, you're, you're likely overpriced for the market. Um, and, 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 counterintuitively to that, I guess, is, is also, you know, a lot of folks in this, in this space talk about a quick sale value. Generally speaking, a quick sale, it's a 90 day quick sale value. So it's 30 days less than, than the average market time. And that is generically a, a, a 10 cent discount. 
Um, and, and these are as is values, right? So, and that's important to understand that so this isn't, you know, we're not trying to create this ARV, uh, you know, after repair value, we're, we're not necessarily trying to run out and, and be, um, you know, the, the fix and flip kind of uh, investor. There is, there is some benefit to the public seeing and believing that you are the bank that foreclosed on this asset. Um, and that leaves them with the expectation that there is going to be some repairs that they're going to have to deal with. And as, as you, as the, um, you know, once the REO reverts back to you, if it does, um, you know, you need to get an agent or, you know, somebody on your team in there so that you can have an understanding of what's going on inside, inside the house um, or property and what might need to be addressed um, and whatnot. And then from there, make sure that obviously you're setting your listing price properly, right? So it's, it's, Dion, it's all about that. Yeah. And Dion, I think we're going to, if we keep this level of detail, we're not going to get through this in our allotted time. So, okay. so let's. All right. So, so, the, so the, the, the last portion here is, is uh, um, sale cost expenses, which the sale cost expense in, in predominantly here, what you see is this is all REO sales, right? So it's all of the things that would be factored into an REO sale. So for instance, you know, if you put the REO out on the market, you got a real estate agent commissions, right? So all of that's factored in. Um, we also have the servicers that we use um, have disposition fees. So if you're with a servicer that has a disposition fee, um, that um, you're going to have a fee that looks like this. If you are not, if you're at a, a, a little bit more of a limited servicing platform, you, you won't have that fee. Okay. Right. So, um, so, so, so that's the, the, the overall picture of the pool. Go ahead. Steve. So let's go, let's go under the hood and take a look on how you construct this. Um, because I, I think there's some real value in people understanding the level of detail that goes into making, making these kinds of, uh, these kinds of estimates. So this is the, so this is the entire pool. Um, you know, when we get a pool, when we get the data, we load it into our template and then we load it into this. And that, that screen, I have to drop this because this thing's in my way. Um, so, so we can start to go through each and every loan individually. So this is loan number one. Um, again, as, we're go as we start going through the pool, you know, there, there's not a lot of magic here. You know, the, the pool is, you know, the first 20 loans are non-performing loans. So in our system, we have the capacity of looking at an asset um, one of two ways. It's either paying or it's not. That's it. There's no magic here. There's either some performance or there's not performance. So we have uh, our, our first look here is is at cash flowing uh, a cash flowing loan. This one isn't cash flowing, so we would we we don't need to look at that. So in the next in our next tab, we have um, our uh, defaulted scenario, and here. We can't, uh, so automatically our easiest thing to do here is, is select our foreclosure uh, disposition strategy. And because this is built into our system, this already auto automatically takes into consideration all the time and all the costs. You know, when, you know, when, was, when was the notice of default issued based in that state? When does that mean that the REO was sold? Um, and this automatically gives us a factor of time and we have a default set for non-performing loans of a 20% uh, internal rate of return, right? So this is a hurdle rate, and this functions as, as like a net present value for us. In other words, what happens is, is at, we can change this hurdle rate, um, and it will affect the bid um, accordingly. I, as such, I can also change the, the time. Um, and, and reasons that you might do that, there may be, um, you know, the, we may look at a, you know, maybe a, a lower bandwidth, um, higher risk area and say, well, you know, for that particular asset, you know, I, maybe I, we really ought to be able to get 25 cents. We don't overly elevate that hurdle rate too much because, you know, you're just going to get to, you still have to have a seller that's willing to sell at a number that they're, they're willing to give you. Right. Um, then, and then in the time frame. So, you know, we talked a little bit about um, maybe markets that are a little bit troubled or maybe, maybe a market that's a little rural. Um, so if we think that, you know, maybe an asset's a little rural and it's going to take a couple extra months to, to sell off, we can actually increase the time frame that it takes to, to sell it off. So by, by adjusting those inputs 
here, we, we define what the bid's gonna be. So we, we are essentially reverse engineering the bid. And as we do that, um, we, can, we can also take a look at, for instance, this other idea over here, which this isn't a good asset for, for this particular for the next segment I wanna tell you. So, um, here for a second. so oftentimes we talk about, we talk about what, um, you know, these, these other, these alternate disposition strategies that, that, uh, that, that oftentimes come up. So deed and lieu, short sale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, so the reason we picked this asset is this has an LTV of 67.8%, right? So we've got a BPO value of 79,000, they owe 53. Um, you know, logically you would look at this and you'd be like, hey, Mr. Barber, sell your house, you know, sell your house, pay us off and you know, you don't get a foreclosure. And that's really what we would want to drive at here. Um, but for whatever reason, this particular asset hasn't, and obviously hasn't done this. So this is this asset details tab. This is just the same details that's on the data tape. It's just an, a, another tab for us. So this particular loan, um, they haven't made a payment since August, 2016, right? So they're, they're behind, you know, it's, they're, they're not, you know, two, three years behind. Um, so we would think that there's maybe there's a lack of incentive, there's a, a break in communication. And again, what we want to do is try to price these out conservatively saying, look, it'd be, it's nice if I can get a deed in lieu or, or get the borrower to do a short sale, but I need to plan for the worst. I need to plan for a borrower that's going to dig his heels in and force me to foreclose. So this is what the foreclosure on this would look like. So at a, at a 20% rate of return, it's going to take us 24 months, this asset is located in Louisiana. Um, at the same point in time, we can also look at what it would look like if this was to get dispositioned as a short sale. And we do that by this, this wholesale margin, we're just gonna make it similar to the, the LTV. And then we can shorten time. So let's say that instead of it taking two years, we think that it's, we can get that to happen in 12 months. And there's no, there, there's no real exact science here, right? Um, when it comes to how quickly or how, um, or how long it takes to be able to produce an alternate disposition. But what, what our system allows us to do, and oftentimes when we are reviewing the loans, I can bring these two concepts up and you can look, you know, where would we rather be? Any investor would rather pay the lesser amount of money here because this is the more conservative approach. If we were to be able to get this borrower to short sale the house, um, it, it, we're really only $5,000 apart, right? So, so here's a little bit of a premium. And sometimes we do use this if we go to a seller of a loan and we deliver a bid that is close, um, but still needs a little work. You know, they, they say, hey, sharpen your pencil here. You know, what can you do? And um, so we may, we may bring up, you know, uh, and take a good hard look at the, um, you know, a, a highly likely strategy and compare and contrast that with the conservative strategy and try to figure out how, you know, how we want to deliver that bid back. Again, there isn't an exact science here, but we don't, we don't automatically hang our hat on this, this, this asset will be a short sale and this is how much money it'll go because there's a lot of things that we don't understand. We don't understand what title looks like. There might be some other, um, there might be some other liens that, that affect this and so on and so forth, right? So, as we're, as we're um, you know, a couple of the other bells and whistles, I guess, to, uh, to sort of point, point out, when, when we, the reason we have standard fields is we reproduce um, the actual loan. So this is the actual, this is the original asset graph. So this is what the loan uh, was supposed to look like as the seller has given us the data. So the original loan amount with the original interest rate over the original time. So let, me, so, we have, so let me slow down here. Right. Yep. So, so your X and Y axis is your Y axis is uh, is the loan amount, the principal, the UP, the the balance, right? That's the blue, and the pink is the interest. And this is the full. The bottom is the full three hundred and whatever months to conclusion. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then so the dot is. Uh, where the loan is in, in, in periods and where the loan is in, in balance, right? 
So this is the unpaid principal balance at this point in time relative to the amortization schedule. And to, so, so th this loan, it's, you know, again, this guy's, you know, he's only, you know, a couple months back. He's, he's next due for, for August. So we don't see too much of a variance here. He's, he's not too far off his principal. He's probably got some interest arrears, right? Because we can see that there's a little interest drag there. Um, and the, yeah, and I, I'm going to bring up another loan just so we can look at a, a contrasting one. So he, for me, is a more likely loan modification candidate because he's not so completely behind, uh, behind the fight like this guy here who should be way closer. Well, you can see where he is. He's out, of bound, he's out of bound of where he should be on the curve. Right. So in, in he, he is, you know, he's at uh, 100. He's, he, he, <laughs> when the dot is above the principal, he is behind in payments. When the dot is below the, the, the principal, they're making prepayments, right? So we can judge what the seller is showing us and what the performance is based on where this dot falls across, you know, in relevance to the, the principal curve. Um, and it, you know, it's, 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 it's not, um, it's not an, it's not a, um, it's not any magical kind of insight, right? What we use this to do um, is we check for modifications to, to see if a modification has been um, disclosed to us. There was one in here that we had that was like that. Um, so we might be able to look at a loan and say, hey, Mr. Seller, you're not telling us about um, a modification that took place. <clears throat> so when you start to see some of the stunted, stunted interest, um, there's something going on in this loan. Something was changed that isn't necessarily being disclosed to us, right? We can see that this isn't really a, a standard um, loan term. Uh, there was a better one. I just don't remember which one it was. So the, the, the point there is, is we, we use this to make sure that the data, that we have some good data integrity. We use it to understand if there is, you know, maybe some potential to work with a borrower through reinstatement or, or create some forbearance. So, um, so that's that. Um, a couple of the other fields that we that we have, you know, when when as we bid each loan, right? What we have is we have a loan page that is exact. This is the exact same summary that we were just looking at. It's just for this particular loan. So all of the fields, <coughs> all of the fields that you see on that summary page are here. And the reason that we provide the summary page is, you know, you, you can kind of do the math. In some of these, P, in, in the PCE, HCE, and SCE, you can get a general average. You take the number of loans and, you know, whatever field, and it's going to tell you. Right? So, for instance, if you look at our BPO fees, in the pool, there's 22 of them. This one's only one. So, each one's 100 bucks, right? So, that's why we provide this. When we provide the loan level, we only provide the, the gross bucket. So that the, so what what the investor is seeing is the, the purchase cost expense, which is here, which is consists of these these fees, right? So um, a, a couple of the other I guess bells and whistles that 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 we have is we have the power to change the the inputs and configurations that we have um, with time, taxes, some of the disposition costs that we have. Um, this is our foreclosure and eviction scenarios. Um, so, so we can change the inputs as we go through a loan. Um, and then, you know, we have a cat in a non-performing loan, it, there's not much cash flow, right? So because we're, got, we're getting out all the way into 10 months uh, and then you have a sale. So that's really what's happening here, right? So it's cost, 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 and then boom, you sold the REO. Um, as th th this table, is actually what creates the IRR, the NPV, right? So we break down each each asset into a, a monthly um, a monthly schedule, and every dollar that goes out. So you're so when you're looking at the um, LPI on this loan, 
the LPI on this loan is um, 840. When we look at the monthly schedule, it's $120 a month, right? So, so we would tell you when, if you were to buy this loan, that you need to be prepared to have some, um, you know, to, 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 to spend these holding costs, but obviously they don't all go out the door at the same time. And this is what, this is what um, you want to manage to, right? So now if you can start shortening time, if you can disposition this faster um, than the 11 months for, for this particular asset, then you're going to save yourself, obviously, some of this money. And so because we're putting the costs and the income into, you know, a, a, a best guess um, time period, that allows us to create a real IRR. And so when we bid this with our, you know, our hurdle rate then becomes the actual IRR. So it's, it's a little reverse engineering. Now in this particular asset, um, you know, with this particular pool, because the seller gave us price indication, what we did is we, we went through and we, we used our standard um, IRR, right? You can see um, some of the IRRs, you know, hit 20. And then we can see some of these didn't. Right. So, for instance, this bad boy came in at, at, at you know, a 4% IRR. And what's going on there is the information that the seller gave us. So this is uh, uh, 595748. The information that the seller gave us on this particular asset isn't allowing us to understand what the um, what's really going on. So pending recorded affidavits. Uh, you know, I have some thoughts on what that should mean, but it doesn't really help me understand. So, so with this particular seller, if there was interest in this loan, we would go back and, and say, what does this mean? Help us quantify that. Help us turn this into uh, an amount of time. And based on that time, we would update the, the, the exit of this. But right now, as this stands, if without this time frame being reduced, we're saying, you know, it's going to take 16 months to do this. And the price that you're asking for is really only going to be a 4% return, right? So in that negotiation, then, you know, we, we would, you know, we, we'd push the seller back and be like, look, you know, we, we need a greater discount uh, or you need to, you know, show us how this thing's going to, going to disposition a little bit faster. And sometimes, you know, again, every seller is going to provide us with different information than that. So with this pool, we back, so what, what we did to get to their asking price because it was provided is we had to back down the hurdle rate, which increased our, um, or increased our purchase price. And that came in line with what they were asking for. So let's go, let's go back up. I think this is, uh, this is a great look under the hood that shows, um, shows how much effort and how much detail goes into these. Um, we could all, of course, do this at home, um, and nobody does. Nobody does. Uh, People throw numbers out there, um, say, and people say yes or no. Um, and so let's go yeah. back. To, let's go back to your cover, back to your uh, Excel sheet. And so, we'll, so if you look at what he's done in the assets tab, he's taken. You know, we've taken all of those, uh, all of that work, consolidated it, and all the way out on the. So on column H, he gives you an exit month. It takes you. Well, what do you think it's going to take to get out of this? Um, all the way through all the, the planning on foreclosure um, and it doesn't always have to go that long and sometimes it goes longer but often it goes shorter um, so he creates his internal purchase price what you're gonna have to have is a required reserve out in column R to ride it out all the way to the end and so that gives you a net sale and we keep going to the right and we look at we look at potential uh, net sale price, potential gross profit, and potential ROI. Um, there's a disclaimer on the front tab of this that should be with any investment that says that says nothing's guaranteed. This is uh, this is our experience and what the marketplace typically holds. Now there were a great many people in this business uh, that lost their shirt back in 2009, uh, including me. Um, and uh, we're back again, and we think we're smarter, and we think we're uh, we think we're doing a better job. Um, but we all still have to be prepared for understanding our own local market. Uh, so when you look at uh, when I look at a sheet like this, 
I immediately go to, I immediately do a data uh, filter and I take the gross profits above what my threshold is for what I want to work on. If you're uh, more interested in, in yield, then you can come back and work from the yield column to look at what you think is, uh, is, be is best that fits, fits, your, uh, fit, fits your, your, your level of work. Uh, yeah, so you look at some of these, uh, some of these uh, net exit prices, um, and people may not want to be in two hundred thousand dollar houses. They may want to be in fifty thousand dollar houses, and uh, because the margin's better there, but it's less gross dollars profit, of course. Um, I found uh, through the uh, thirty or so accounts that we've looked that, that we've purchased and the. I don't know how many files we've gone through. We probably looked at we probably looked at three or four hundred assets to pick those thirty. Um, we made a lot of bids that we lost um, because our bids were what we thought that they could be. Um, and there's people out there that are willing to pay more. Um, you, you, the, this doesn't include does not include the detailed diligence work that goes into making these kind of selections. And some folks like to do that work themselves. Um, I particularly don't for, uh, for a reason of not having a lot of expertise, but particularly because I don't know what's not there. I know what's there, but I don't know what's not there when I reassemble chains of title and assignments of mortgages and allonges. Um, it's better for me to make sure that the asset's completely uh, workable right from day one where people are more than happy to buy broken chains. Um, but my exit strategy is not uh, loan modification and reinstatement. My exit strategy is push for sale is really what I'm after is pushing for push, pushing for a short sale and let the client walk, let the, uh, the borrower walk away with a little pocket money to start over. Uh, and let me, let me interject a couple things there, Steve. So um, the, the, there's really two, there's two ways that the market tr trades loans, you know, and, and, and the, the later is, is a little bit more of a function of, of the emergence of the street level investor. And so, you know, institutionally and uh, institutionally, a pool is produced, you know, we, we've all seen it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a data tape, it gets pushed out and it goes to multiple potential um, buyers and they produce a bid. And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call that a little bit more of the institutional style where again, we're gonna assume that the, the data that's provided from the seller um, has a level of, of integrity and we are going to deliver an indicative bid, a bid that is subject to due diligence. If all of the data that you provided us is correct, then this is the number, this is the dollar amount that we'll pay for these loans. Um, and if it's not, then it's obviously that, that that's not going to be our bid anymore. And so you have an indicative bid, you have due diligence, and then you have a final price. Um, and that's sort of the, the, you know, the macro cycle of, of trading a loan a little bit more institutionally. Some sellers, um, and I think, I think a lot of the gurus do this now too, but, um, you know, they they push investors into delivering a final price as an indicative bid. And so I am, I am grossly against that um, because what, what that demands is that demands that you spend time, money, and resources on doing due diligence and reviewing an asset that you may not even trade. So if, if, if Steve and I are, in, are, are both looking at the same pool and the seller here is demanding final pricing up front, that means that Steve and I both need to go get BPOs and go get title and, you know, spend time and, you know, have people go look at the property. Um, so we're spending time and money and only one of us is going to win that asset. And it becomes a little bit of a fire drill of who can get that work done the fastest and get back to the seller and claim the asset, if you will. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the counterparties that, that we deal with, we, um, e e sometimes they even have that policy and I still push against it for the sake of our team um, because it's just not what, it's not, it's not the right way to do that. We don't want to run fire drills. We prefer what, what we would consider a negotiated trade. You know, we want to be able to have a conversation. We want to be able to know the loans that we are awarded and then we want to go spend money on um, due diligence. And even when you do it that way, even when you trade institutionally, right? As Steve was mentioning, we look at a lot of loans, 
we bid less than we look at and we buy less than we bid. So there's a natural filter to that process. There's going to be fallout because something's going to be, there's going to be a material defect with the, um, there's going to be a material defect with the, uh, the loan that, you know, maybe you don't want to purchase it anymore. Maybe, um, you know, maybe it just doesn't fit um, or some, you know, maybe something happened on the seller side. Um, so, so I, I, I wanted to point that out because there's a lot of what I would call forceful sales tactics that take place with, with newbies. And if you don't know, you know, this, this is one of the reasons that, you know, I would, you know, advocate, you know, aligning yourselves with someone that's been in the industry like ourselves, um, because you don't know what you don't know. And you're going to think that that's normal. That's what everybody does. And what, what you find is there's lessons out there where they're like, wait, do these shortcuts, you know, go, go look tight, go look the chain and title up yourself um, so that you don't have to spend the money on due diligence. I would tell you that's absurd. I, you know, I, you know, Steve, Steve and I have worked together for, for a while and, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the most capable people of doing such a task and I would never do that because it's, it's time consuming. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to miss stuff. Um, and so really the only solution there is you go to a proper vendor and you have the proper work done. And when you take those shortcuts, that's when you end up in bad investments that are going to be difficult to recover from. Absolutely. So, so I think that's probably enough for this session. We've gone a little longer than we thought. We're going to do more of these uh, the, uh, to explore the other uh, facets of diligence and, and uh, we'll go into workouts and, and uh, how to deal with servicers and other sort of topics. Um, but uh, again, you can reach uh, Dion at, uh, his name is Dion DiPioli, and you can reach him at Dion at sdxs.us, and you can find me at Steve at modernassetmanagement.com. Um, I hope this has uh, been useful for everybody. And if you like it, please, uh, please let us know. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ciao.